Can you hear me? Okay. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's nice to be close to home. And um, you're going to hear me, so you better like uh, take it easy for an hour because um, I take the opportunity to talk and um, really think about what we as a firm are up to. And um, so sort of these are milestones for us. Um, really sort of uh, understand um, the meaning of uh, our, our you know, the work that our office is doing and uh, being in Los Angeles, which is uh, all happens to be a fantastic laboratory. So uh, I do, you know, I want to make sure that you know that uh, we, you know, we, we want to share here tonight uh, a significant amount of work um, and time that we've spent um, as a firm so thinking some, about some of these ideas. So um, I've, been, I've been accused of being a regionalist, and, uh, and I, I think maybe I share that in common a little bit with Dean Ma, that you know, he's passionate about China, and somehow I'm passionate about California. And perhaps if, though, if both places weren't as interesting as they are, um, we might have like spread our wings and been many other places um, exploring um, or doing work in other places, but I certainly find it here uh, that, that there's tremendous opportunity. And of course, I didn't know it's completely possible. Um, you want to, oh, and I'm supposed to do this. Um, and uh, thank you, Astrid. Um, I didn't know, of course, uh, before I came here, and I'm going to go back a bit here, just a second. I didn't know um, before I moved to LA, of course, uh, that I'd be joined by about two million um, Salvadorians. And I am from El Salvador, so perhaps the fact that I can buy pupusas and that there's lots of palm trees and uh, that there's a wonderful climate <coughs> make me, makes me feel uh, particularly at home. And um, uh, I kind of was trying really hard not to use the word sustainability, but I decided to come right up front and get it out of uh, my system and our system, just to put it out there. Um, in John Dornbeck argued in his book, Agenda for Sustainable America, that sustainable development among the, is among the most important ideas to come back out of the 20th century. It should be right up there with democratic promotion, human rights protection, free markets, collective security, and the need to combat poverty on a worldwide basis. And there is no question that, you know, basically we've hit the wall and that the world is hot, flat, and crowded, and we got to address it, um, to quote, of course, Tom Friedman. Everything we care about, a growing economy, human well-being, and security is comprised, un uh, undermined, or lessened by environmental degradation. So we have to uh, actually come to terms with the fact that uh, our human values and morality are very much involved and encompassed in an attitude about working in the, in the urban environment. The other thing I'd like to get out there is on the fact that somehow the field of architecture and engineering have sacred names, but our discipline, landscape architecture, has kind of the profession, you know, the title always gets uh, reinvented. And so we went uh, several years back into a, a term called landscape urbanism, coined by Charles, Wal Charles Waldheim and a few others and that aspired to highlight the importance uh, of dealing with cities with coherent strategies that dealt with environmental systems. Hello, that in my generation was all landscape architecture. And uh, with all due respect to Charles, I do argue with him about the, 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 new, the coining of the new name. But more recently, um, I learned that there's a new term Geo designer that has been coined, and that has been uh, coined to describe uh, the sort of the way we can embrace GIS technologies and help make intelligent, 
complex decisions related to design and planning and evaluating impacts and opportunities. As an example, calculating the consequence of carbon output. I pose the question whether the problem is with the, with the word landscape in front of architecture. It's a, is it about land or is it about scape? Or what is it? Should we be calling it land shape architecture? What I do know is that regardless of the name, one needs to have a strong vision about the power of design, and you have to take risks. As a firm in California, we strive to make a difference, take on infrastructure, and deploy landscape architecture strategies to pr propel change. This is what I will share with you tonight. So uh, I will go through a, a series of projects, uh, but mostly I will talk about how my pro projects actually touch sort of these infrastructure elements that I, can't, I always have to address as I'm moving through. One of the things we all know that is, is that LA is basically Southern California. There is no beginning and no end to this megalopolis. And as we move and uh, sort of act uh, as designers within this area, we're constantly uh, going up and down the coast and around um, east and west, north and south. Uh, so this is an interesting map of Los Angeles in 1871, with, which was with a population of 1,800 people. And, uh, and uh, now it's, of course, uh, 11,000 people, and now it's uh, 9 million. And what's happening here is that it's going automatic. Francis, can you come here for a second? Who's back there that can, I'm going on automatically, and it's going through. share with students how I got to where I am today. So, I married Michael Lair while I was in graduate school, so you never know, in 30 years you'll be in the same place, speaking up here in front of an audience. Uh, we uh, moved back to California because of opportunity, and guess what? 30 years ago, there was a recession. And we have survived to tell the tale. So, if any of you are really, you know, wondering what's going to be with you, hang in there. We need designers, um, and you might have to find a way in doing different kinds of work, uh, or you know, work that's parallel to sort of uh, the kind of work you want to be doing. But you know, you'll you, this time shall shall also pass, and there are opportunities out there. So um, now I'm I'm back to. Uh, eight, 1811, and, and uh, I now have uh, 1871, and I have 11,000 people in Los Angeles. You know, a beautiful arid valley um, that became populated, and where we are today, um, we are in a, you know an immense city with many millions of people. It's, it's uh, stretches uh, 
now it's going automatically again, guys. You gotta. I don't know how to fix that. Really? Yeah. You know. So, I'm sorry. That's when you don't bring your own laptop, I guess. These kinds of things happen. Um, so I'll I'll go back to because you, I'm telling my my story is going backwards. Um, so we moved out here and living in uh, Orange County for some years before we actually moved back to uh, Los Angeles to um, and started our practices. And since then, of course, uh, we've uh, moved through a. Um, a decades of uh, a practice that's gone from doing um, those gardens of Eden that Los Angeles is well known for to actually the kind of work that, uh, that we do today, which is more in the urban realm, although we still do houses. And uh, we find that the work that we do in gardens um, for people in the industry are actually a great portal uh, for advocacy. So if you need um, uh, someone to come to your Tree People event and do uh, sort of the, 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 be the MC for the fundraising evening, you too could get uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Christopher Guest if you had done their garden. Um, so it works in every which way. It allows all of us to explore materials and um, actually. So 2010, and you can see this aerial uh, where California stretches beyond, where Los Angeles stretches without boundaries. And um, Los Angeles actually uh, obviously works uh, in, a, in mysterious ways. It needs a tremendous amount of water to survive, and actually works uh, with water that it borrows banks and borrows and buys from Northern California and the Colorado River. Um, and uh, most of the water, most of the electrical needs um, in, in the uh, state are actually moving water up and down the state, believe it or not. And of course, ironically, part, although fire in our iron climate would be part of the natural process, um, we actually have this amazing issue where urbanization has clashed. And uh, we have had, you know, as much as many millions of acres uh, of land um, and landscape that has burned over the last uh, seven years. Uh, and but Los Angeles is amazing, and it is the land of many, many inventions and discoveries. And it is looked by the world, and it happens to be one of the tenth, uh, the tenth largest and most dynamic economies. Um, and the tenth, as a country, it's considered a country. And uh, look at all the amazing innovations that we have produced. Um, and uh, it, in like America, however, California is unformed, innovative, and historic, and hedonistic, acquisitive, and energetic um, area, only more so. And that's well it's like it's a vast area of lights captured by Andreas Garski. Um, Los Angeles is one of the most diverse cities in the world uh, with more ethnicities, religions, languages, and recent immigrants than anywhere else. LA has become so diverse and so dispersed that the sense of wholeness is kind of elusive, as I talked about before. It also has the most cars and most freeways and probably the most impervious and per impervial surfaces or certainly any of the large cities. LA, we know, has been a city about private property and private fantasy. It's been about having your own slice of real estate and using the landscape as an empty canvas on which the project your individual, uh, for your individual fantasies. Beautiful and often imaginative landscapes define the idyllic image of Los Angeles, um, but sprawl, traffic, and the lack of public space or a collective sense of community Air pollution and degradation of rivers in, ocean, in the ocean while flight and end of suburbia um, is, is really evident. And yes, this is Los Angeles. Um, believe me, at the National Building Museum presentation that I made earlier, this 
last week, and I showed this and some other images of Los Angeles, it's hard for people to understand how we let things go. How is it possible that this, this city got to this point of degradation? Um, and of course, for better or for worse, the world goes to LA and has the most extreme social environmental problems, but uh, often glorified through the lens of the camera, Hollywood, the producer of iconic images and dreamscapes, it's it, and it, it, you know something we all recognize because of it, it's the uh, because of the freeways and ports that offers the best opportunity for landscape architects and planners to make a difference, especially in a region such as LA that is going through a, a major redevelopment. For me, a livable city is about the right balance of jobs, housing, transportation, and housing. And so uh, when I talk about recalibration, it, all, it, it, it is about trying to change that paradigm and that basic balance. Um, this is a well-known tale, but it's worth recalling that LA once had the makings of a sustainable infrastructure. Its Pacific Railway system shown here in 1920, was the most extensive in the world, 1,100 kilometers of track, that none of which really exists today. Um, GM and tire companies conspired to rip it all out, which left LA with no functioning passenger rail in all, at all until the 1990s. The rebuilt LA Metro is a fraction of its former self, even if its population LA, Mexico City, and Sao Paulo. It's interesting in terms of sheer scale is in many respects like Mexico City and Sao Paulo. And it's interesting to compare to the city on key metrics of individual of energy use, CO2 emissions. The, the citizens of the developing countries have a lighter footprint than we do. And I would argue it's not just a function of greater wealth and consumption in the US. Imagine these amazing statistics right here. Um, actually, I was glad to see that there were that basically um, the work, the crime wasn't as high in these cities, but the use of water and actually um, the use of public transportation, of course, and also pollution um, is is amazing. Um, the marked difference between the countries um, and. The, and the transit system, you know, between Mexico City, um, Los Angeles, and Sao Paulo, and of course um, the ecological footprint goes along with this, just in terms of the sheer scale of space that it takes up. Um, and Los Angeles and the existing infrastructures, and I say infrastructures because um, it's so complex. Uh, but 4,000 square miles, 9.5 million population, 51 freeways, um, and it creates a complex web, web that we have to tackle, negotiate, and navigate while engaging in the public realm. The city of Los Angeles is within the county of Los Angeles, so clearly we have a lot of jurisdictional issues that we also address as we're addressing infrastructure and uh, we're at one of them is as an example the of course the watershed we'll talk a little bit about the work in the river but it goes beyond um, the watershed boundaries obviously go beyond the city of Los Angeles um, boundaries um, and the rivers and streams the rails and trails all of which come to, to create this incredibly rich sort of mosaic to work within the highways, the schools, thousands and thousands of camp campuses, including community colleges and public schools, no private schools included in here, so there's actually many more. And then the, the faults, the landfills, the ports, and the airports, all part of this uh, web. And of course, the parks. 
and uh, although Los Angeles uh, is uh, basically a city that uh, has some wonderful parks in the system, one of, the thing, one of the things it forgot to do was to plan for parks and to plan for schools as the city grew and got denser in um, the eastern and southern parts of the city, northern parts of the city too, um, towards the east side. And uh, therefore, parks within a 20 minute distance of any kind of uh, walkable, uh, walkable distance are uh, rare in those areas. Um, the, our firm, we're committed to many scales and planning projects and design projects and we generate our own research and explore grants and other opportunities. Um, and I venture to say that the triggers in working in this sort of urban environment is civic activism, community engagement, passion for design, honoring of systems and, and uh, celebrating urbanism. And, uh, so what we can do with the infrastructure that, what can we do with the infrastructure that we can inherit it, and that we have inherited, and how can we repurpose the urban DNA of Los Angeles? We, before we can deploy aggressive strategies that might be recalibrate and improve the urban environment, we need to understand the watersheds, the air sheds, and the food sheds. Um, so uh, in order to delve into the watershed, um, We'll talk a little bit about the LA River and a couple of other projects that we've dealt with that deal with sort of, uh, the watershed issues. Um, it, the river represents an ambitious mission that transforms 32 miles of concrete lined river into a, a public space in the heart of one of, uh, one of the most populated cities in America. Clearly the motivation uh, was not public space, uh, or for that matter, revitalization. It was water quality and a series of fines that were going to be coming down from the federal government in terms of water quality. If you deliver a certain a level of water quality down to the ocean um, and it wasn't uh, up to a certain standard, you would be uh, sort of um, given major fines. So the, the major motivator and uh, yet multi-benefit projects are certainly um, uh, become uh, the beneficiary of uh, this trigger. And uh, as you can see here, part of the reason the river actually got uh, harnessed by engineers of the, is because um, they had learned how to use concrete, but also because we had these uh, horrible uh, floods in the 1940s, and the, uh, as the city had grown, it sort of uh, kind of hugged the river, and most of the transportation system had really developed along it, um, the need be, uh, became evident that to protect the population, uh, the river had to be harnessed. Uh, the, river, the river is it, uh, has the potential to be an integrator, the crucial first step towards a regional open space network for Los Angeles. The river has the potential to integrate jurisdictions, communities, and habitats, and basically one of the things I have learned to appreciate, it's the only piece of infrastructure that's on grade. Therefore, it is that open space void that has the potential to accommodate environmental and social functions. You don't have to go over a bridge or under a bridge um, to get to it. The, uh, the plan was incredibly ambitious. Uh, the master plan, it was run uh, by the city, by the Bureau of Engineering. We worked with the team, including um, a couple, two other landscape architecture and design firms, uh, and team, uh, Wayne and uh, Civitas, and this is clearly the case in many of these larger scale projects um, where we actually work. Um, so uh, I bring this up because the world looks to the, our beautiful people, and certainly in this case, uh, our Terminator, and through the lens of a camera, accepts the channel, channelized river as a panacea. Uh, LA, LA uh, projects uh, are, you know, are thrilling to many people and filled with beautiful people. Uh, beautiful people. They think of LA as an area, a place with beautiful people, and uh, then the world, the world revels in this aesthetic as though this is uh, the right solution. Uh, one of five watersheds within. Uh, the, the area, of course, and uh, the freeway, uh, the, 
the ambition is uh, major, and as you can see, of course, the river in red, um, the freeways in blue. Somehow, in all this time, during since the 1940s, um, they forgot to build schools, they forgot to build uh, parks, but the freeways really uh, took on um, an amazing and a very effective uh, sort of air, way of getting people and uh, people around the city and developing an, an important piece of infrastructure. And here you see um, basically that, that uh, park space and that void in the park space with um, the white areas uh, and the areas that are outside of it, you know, in 20 minute walking distance. Um, and access to parks um, all across the city. Uh, and where does the river start? Well, it, start, it starts at a high school uh, where Bell Creek and Calvest and Breeze come together and they meet. And then as it traverses down here to the north towards Griffith Park and uh, south and, and east towards downtown along the Legion Park through downtown, so it travels through residential and commercial, institutional and industrial areas, harnessed always by rail, um, and uh, through the industrial downtown. Dozens and dozens of community meetings, really engaging community, and what I would say about engaging community is it's a lot about learning how to impart knowledge um, to, this, to the, the, the participants in these um, community about decisions that they're making, and, and um, so it's about a lot about education. Of course, we have the tremendous benefit in Los Angeles of uh, a lot of environmental uh, nonprofits that are very active and engaged in uh, making uh, their agendas known and uh, weighing in on decisions along the way. And one of the interesting things, of course, as you're looking at your uh, the scopes of work, we were asked to look at 200 feet on either side of the river. And if you're thinking um, about infrastructure or about environment, you realize that 200 feet on either side of that river basically was a block. So we really started looking at a way of thinking of this river zone um, that had uh, more meaning. And in, in, on one end, it actually, uh, the edge became topography. Basically, uh, the, uh, the the base of Griffith Park and Elysian Park, and on the other side were not only uh, some some of the hills and mountains of East LA, but also major roadways and boulevards um, that actually define communities. And that was a and then as for, in terms of a series of strategies, we dealt with river, open space, and then the framework. Green streets and, and ways of getting the community from the schools, their homes, uh, their libraries to the river and starting to deal with the way that the river and this series of activities and strategies would propel revitalization um, and new economic opportunities. And I will talk about that um, in a minute. So we called this the Fire Us Scheme. Um, and uh, the reason was because we were really being aggressive about taking land and really trying to, to deal with the fact that the river was harnessed in a very sort of, uh, in, in a way that uh, didn't allow for a lot of restoration work um, that needed to happen. But anyway, here it is, and it would sort of, in the end, produce uh, about 6,000 uh, acres of land um, and a river system that uh, really was, is healthier and and more meaningful and a much bigger part um, of this uh, valley. And okay. And I talked about some of the, the ways you get involved in the, as we're looking at our, at our office. And one of the ways we get involved is we do a lot of, even though we don't have a nonprofit, we do a lot of pro bono work. This is a charrette that we're doing uh, with, between a few firms, including Perkins and Will, um, and it's dealing with the piggyback yards. Um, and uh, it's uh, in, in here you see the piggyback yards, 
um, Union Station, um, the, the part of the USC Medical Campus down in here, Elysian Park. It's a project that we've been working on over the last uh, few weeks, and uh, it was at, as a request of, from the Friends of the LA River to try to understand, deal with um, basically this intractable piece of uh, rail yards, uh, 300 uh, odd acres surrounding, um, in the, the, surrounded by East LA and across the river uh, from uh, downtown, an opportunity to really connect uh, to the, uh, the residential and or certainly to the brewery and other, and to, to actually plug in the idea of a green technology corridor. Um, the reason to address uh, this this piece of land is that the rail, the high-speed rail that is coming through, of course, wants to come through right through this area, right through downtown. And so we want to, when Polar's idea um, as an advocate is to try to will it to become something else. So here you see the Green Tech Corridor, uh, the work lift housing uh, for artists associated with the brewery, and then a, and a park space that actually can flooded during 50 and 100 year floods. Um, and uh, this is a project that actually is going to live on the internet on a website as a way to think about the site um, as uh, the uh, high speed rail moves forward, an alternative to uh, the taking of the land for one single purpose. Oops. Um, some ideas um, about, of course, what the site will be. Um, and really integrating rail as part of and then doing the restoration project and actually uh, capturing water and taking water on the site and uh, recovering a uh, daylight stream as it goes through the site and connecting to Mission Road through a series of passages and um, allowing for a big mixed use uh, development in that area. And ending the river um, with the Port of Los Angeles, and the river comes right down here, uh, a, pro a project that we worked on over the last uh, seven or eight years was really dealing with the port um, and uh, the initial sort of port operations from the 1940s where the, the, the ships were about a fourth the size of the ships that now have to be um, operating out of the site. So this became basically unusable land, which uh, the city actually of San Pedro really wanted to reclaim um, in terms of um, commu community and uh, sort of the relationship to the water. And uh, so the revitalization, the, the urban, dis urban design project we worked on was about bringing the city back and around it into um, the uh, abandoned lands that are now um, operating out of the rest of the port. And of course, the port of Los Angeles is actually in Long Beach, handle 80% of California's and over 30% of the nation's content containerized trade. Um, so as you're dealing with all these um, pieces of work, you're also dealing with traffic circulation and the fact that we've needed um, a lot of the oil that we're actually producing on the basin and that we import into Los Angeles. Um, and as part of a 13, um, the city of Los Angeles has a, uh, 13 drinking water reservoirs. This happens to be Silver Lake. Silver Lake it basically uh, it provides uh, water to 600 uh, uh, residents south of the Silver Lake area. And uh, obviously communities uh, were a very much, I grew around these uh, reservoirs and identified with the reservoirs, the heart of their community. But um, one of the issues, of course, is they can't get very close to it. And so you can see it from far away, so yet so close and yet so far. Uh, the community insisted in, in, uh, 
about 10 years ago to actually uh, sit down with the UNP about the possibility of actually renegotiating uh, the deals uh, about sort of access. And that led to a series of master plan efforts, um, one of which we worked on, the one from Silver Lake, and uh, eventually negotiated a series of phasing strategy to actually uh, first create just a simple path all around the river. Part of what I want to uh, impart you know, to, to the students today is not all the projects you work on in the city uh, when you're working at the level that we're working on the sexy set of projects that make the cover of magazines. Some of them, um, though, have the potential of really changing the lives of thousands of people and the way they live in the city. And this is, for me, one of the most satisfying projects and uh, pleasurable projects. The second phase of the project, Beyond the Path, was actually the potential of opening a meadow, which is about seven acres um, uh, on, the, on the lake. Uh, we thought it was a celebration. It seemed like a no-brainer. You'd open the, the, if the money was there, why wouldn't you make it accessible to the community if you wanted to do it? Well, NIMBYism is why that wasn't the case. So here you see the poor councilman um, feeling quite dejected as thousands of people showed up with Save the Meadow. Save the Meadow meant don't get into my meadow. Keep it closed. Don't let anybody in. You don't want piñatas here. And uh, there's, you know, there's other reasons why we don't want anybody here. We prefer for it to be enclosed and not accessible. Um, so that is not what's going to happen. It is going to open up um, and the economy is slowing things down. But this is the first phase. It is two and a half miles, so it's, it's a relatively costly proposition, but now people get around and circumnavigate the lake. Um, so the place has changed the neighborhood and uh, we have spot, we think in the future, uh, the, 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 you know, civil lake could turn into a sort of a public amenity, um, and uh, we look forward to the day when that happens. When actually, as a coincidence, the drinking water uh, reservoir is is going to go offline and uh, go on to uh, with tanks along the LA River. Um, another lake that we've dealt with is actually uh, the Dominicone Lake, the largest drinking water reservoir in the country six months of emergency water supply for Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, what this obviously project is a lot about is water conservation in the arid climate. So this was really well planned. The system, the water delivery system in California is incredibly well planned. And there was foresight 25 years ago to create this lake. Um, this is, uh, the architect is Michael Lair. He's in the audience and uh, it actually got lead platinum as a, uh, those two museums got lead platinum, um, the first lead platinum museums in the country. And a, again, uh, an amazing a sort of technological feat, the building of this uh, reservoir, and took a valley and built two dams, and there it is. And coming from, coming from China, no big deal, this happens all the time. Uh, but it's, uh, it's something that, uh, so our, our job was this tiny little spot, which happens to be 30 acres, so it's not that small. Um, and uh, it's about a museum of paleontology and water. Talking, uh, they found some amazing bones here as they were digging, and then water, water conservation issues are uh, basically the subject of the museum. Um, and, um, this is the map, the plan, uh, with the two buildings and a series of demonstration gardens around the site, uh, with uh, the notion that there be uh, a lot, a, a series of uh, outdoor exhibits that really start talking about the way water got delivered uh, to the urban, to uh, to to the cities, but also the frailty and the amazing grace of uh, these wonderful braided streams that um, existed in California that, we, that now are channelized. Um, and here, and the, and here you see we also uh, 
actually used uh, the funding was meek, and so we were very cautious about how we used uh, uh, money, but we also wanted to explore uh, innate materials as part of the landscape palette. And uh, of course, uh, photovoltaics allowed us for some shade um, as you enter the, the project, and uh, uh, people really, um, through LEED, really want to be able to understand um, what they're seeing, of course, and then one of my greatest pleasures was to arrive uh, a year later and actually found a wedding taking place in this uh, environment. So some. So we've now quenched the thirst and we're moving on to our airshed. And of course, uh, as uh, you know, as we've worked in uh, one of the uh, in, in this industrial landscape, there's no question that oil and uh, petroleum products are clearly uh, the source of the growth and the fantastic growth of Southern California. This was a master plan we worked on in 2001 that was put forward by a nonprofit. Conservancy who wanted to went, come to the conclusion that um, although the only a few hundred, a couple hundred of these 1,400 acres were actually in uh, public hands, that unless there was a vision for this site, that it would forever remain this island in the inner city. So uh, we won this competition. I worked on this uh, nine years ago, and I continue to work on this project with the Conservancy, which now gets uh, funding every year to actually buy uh, chunks of land. Um, and they are now up to about 800 acres and uh, doing some really uh, interesting um, work. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this community also was afraid of a park. They actually originally preferred to have uh, a oil field surrounded by chain link fencing because at least they know knew what was going on there um, but with time and with sort of a lot of work through churches and schools we got to get uh, an understanding of what this site could be all about and here they are trying to save the park from uh, a, a, uh, the proposal to actually build a power plant on the site five years after we had gotten started this is the first project where the notice went out of the uh, power plant, and this is in uh, about 2005, and um, emails went out, and a thousand people showed up at the local community college. Um, and uh, for many people find this place uh, really interesting, and, and I do too, but there are um, hundreds of thousands of people who live around it who actually um, have to live uh, with very, um, un difficult environmental conditions related to air, water, um, and just visual pollution. Um, they are beautiful, uh, those little derricks, but when there's thousands of them and you know that half of them are actually not operable, you ask yourself um, whether that really would be the case if it wasn't in a different part of the city um, than where it is located. Uh, I've been working with the city, uh, with the county of Los Angeles, um, trying to understand, to, to work on a community benefits package uh, to address the, the site and figure out a way of actually planting a forest. Um, it's now a tangle of infrastructure blanketed with you know, poles, pipelines, derricks, overhead transmission lines also. And since it opened in 1924, uh, the, it has been operated very helter-skelter. Um, among the things we have understood is that uh, with new technology, of course, you can consolidate and uh, it, it can make a huge difference. And the goal would be to actually go from a, uh, a site with uh, 948 acres of oil to about 200. Um, of consolidated oil fields, the balance being part land. 
And who knew that um, dollar, dollars uh, didn't grow on trees, but um, you know, you can do an urban forest and eventually, of course, um, benefit um, in, in, very, in many ways in terms of carbon emissions and clean air and community health. And um, I worked with uh, one of my students uh, at Harvard, and we uh, did a cost-benefit analysis to demonstrate what you know the value of this land would be. And it was actually very interesting. Uh, the, the land and the development of the park would be, uh, you know, basically uh, a tremendous uh, sort of uh, it would be 1.4 billion dollars with about uh, a two billion dollar benefit through green jobs, tourism. Uh, and uh, also valuing community and environmental health. Um, and of course, uh, over time, uh, the cap and trade uh, sort of in the park of the urban uh, was uh, has tremendous value. Another 1,400-acre package, which is part of the, sort of this infrastructure, in this case, you know, industrial uh, sort of infrastructure that deals with the airshed, is the Orange County Great Park. Uh, it's being on the, built on the site of the old El Toro Marine Base, um, 1,400 acres, uh, and uh, it's uh, you know basically at a, in a community coming of age. And amazingly enough, uh, with with I'm not sure quite the foresight, but MetroLink and Amtrak are right here, and it happens to connect uh, the Northern Preserve and Cleveland National Preserve with the Southern. Um, Laguna Preserve. So it has tremendous opportunity as sort of a habitat connector. Um, and so the goal, of course, is to restore the sterile expanse at El Toro with a living landscape. Beautiful, uh, based, uh, beautiful 350 foot wide uh, runways. Uh, it is an incredibly beautiful setting, um, beautiful sky. Um, it's uh, a, we have about, um, so the park. We have 12 miles of runways that we have to contend can with, and it really is a, a, an opportunity for a new destination that deals with culture, and it deals with uh, ecology, and it deals with sports and other activities. Um, this was the heart of, of course, the agricultural production um, in that area was orange groves, hence the Orange County, and, and hence our orange balloon. As the mayor at the time said, it's a good thing it's not avocados because it wouldn't sound as good in county, but um, it certainly allows for some very uh, wonderful sort of, uh, uh, sort of in, in timely ways of uh, describing the place. Uh, and one of my significant roles in, uh, is the community uh, outreach process. And here you see a large map that we uh, you know, unfolded in a uh, courtyard, not, a, not much, a little bigger than perhaps the courtyard outside Watt, uh, where we actually unfolded the plan and allowed people on a Saturday to really experience what the, the park was all about. Uh, to make sure that their opinions and ideas have been reflected in the plan. So, uh, as I said, it's uh, it's a you know has you know it's an, an ambition that uh, basically is moving through the process and uh, goes from a 1.4 billion dollar uh, project down to a 200 million dollar project. You have to make some decisions. We we had you know sustainability as a sort of a, a, a goal that we were striving for and we thought of sustainability in, in very many sort of rich ways and many layers that dealt with personal health and regional health and global health and, and of course energy and water and people and materials were all part of the equation. And uh, we have an artist, Mary Miss, involved and in, uh, how to make sustainability tangible was really one of the ambitions. And uh, as we've moved through, and we've actually done schematic design for all 1,400 acres, 
Um, we now start implementing uh, about 28 acres uh, of project every year. Um, July 11th is when the money got transferred, and that's when uh, we actually uh, 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 open up the next piece of park. Um, this is the cultural terrace, one of the areas that you know, we're working on right now with a lake, uh, a botanical garden, and outdoor performance space, and then a series of cultural venues that we're actually uh, doing some uh, studies on as we speak with a series of uh, people who are actually looking to fund these projects. The botanical garden is the lake and the Enrique Norton's Bridge taking it from the cultural terrace to the botanical garden across the lake. Um, it was part of our master plan. And uh, many of the bridges and features that um, allowed uh, the canyon to happen. Um, here we see uh, three years ago the beginning of the breaking of um, some of the runways. And um, the, the idea of deploying um, 28 acres of, uh, pro, of uh, park at, a t at a, every year um, so to keep with uh, the funding we've actually done uh, the summer programs that are, are in the open air with uh, art and music and we're also developing 200 acres of uh, community gardens. And this is uh, a timeline that talks about the history of the site, so we're being very uh, ingenious uh, with our funding in terms of using paint and, uh, and other sort of uh, materials to really make the project come alive. We call these the lost and found because uh, they were somehow found in, uh, in the midst of all the morass of uh, this wonderful sort of web of infrastructure. So the food shed. And, uh, you know, the Los Angeles food shed is, uh, Los Angeles uh, is a actually produces um, a, a, about 40% of the f fruits and vegetables and nuts that are consumed across the country. But we only, um, in Los Angeles, eat 2% of the, uh, the, the pro produce uh, from the LA area, and the rest is all imported. So there's clearly a tremendous amount of um, the recalibration that needs to happen. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest in the community in terms of uh, trying to find ways of dealing with urban agriculture. And um, there will be a need for uh, other food sources and sites for production. And so rethinking about how we produce the food um, more locally is something um, we have been working on. Um, one acre of land and they can produce, which is 125 parking spaces and two big roofs and uh, can produce a tremendous amount of food. And so we have to start thinking of ways that we can um, shift that paradigm of um, importing food from long distances, even across oceans. Um, and uh, in working on a couple of redevelopment projects in uh, South Central, um, we started thinking about the Jordan Downs area, and we actually took uh, the South LA uh, area to sort of evaluate what the possibilities were of this 3,000-acre 3, uh, area in terms of producing food. And what we discovered, if we looked at the schools, and we looked at the alleys, and we looked at the underutilized parcels, that we could actually look at 269 acres of available land meeting about 24% of the, uh, local, the need of uh, the local community. So obviously, we can, you know, a big difference can be made um, by really rethinking about where food comes from, and where we can grow it, and can it be a land use, um, and can we get permits to actually um, make these projects happen. And last year was uh, run by Good Magazine and was rethinking your farmers markets. And uh, we actually rethink it, rethought it by, by working on a, a strategy of how to deploy food to the, uh, in, in a more e e equity base, with more equity base across to neighborhoods. And you know, we are a cult cult part culture, and um, although I did not grow up in Southern, Cal grow up in Southern California, 
uh, as I understand it, whoa, um, there, there was, you know, uh, for a long time, uh, libraries and other things that were on wheels, and now, of course, taco trucks. So our, our, now our idea was to have a series of uh, basically hubs that happen east, north, north, south, and east of the city. Food gets brought into them uh, by the farmers, who, by the way, are pretty tired of having to come in to, to service 280 uh, uh, far, uh, farmers markets. Um, so they can go back to do what they need to do, and then a whole new set of people, part of this co-op, now start delivering food to neighborhoods that they're interested in working with. And uh, as a result, uh, so here you see uh, what that would bring, and actually we're in the process of producing a, a business plan for this project at the request of the California uh, Agriculture. Um, and finally, community. And again, I talked a, a little bit earlier about um, South Central Los Angeles. This is Jordan Downs. We're actually working um, on Jordan Downs in um, Hollywood Park. And uh, as a, both projects represent 4,000 new units and uh, a lot more. Both projects are actually, um, uh, one is a housing authority from the uh, city of Los Angeles private developer. Um, the, this single purpose project actually becomes a new mixed use community. Um, and uh, so we actually produce uh, not only housing, but we actually end up producing a, a tremendous amount of uh, new uh, urban forest cover uh, through 6,000 additional trees planted on the site. Uh, this is uh, Jordan Downs, and it's actually the birthplace of the Crips and the Bloods. Uh, by the way, we are very well known for exporting, among other things, although we are innovators in California. We've also exported gang culture to, um, to Central um, and South America, unfortunately. Um, so here, this is sort of these two projects, Urban Infill, where we have an opportunity of really deploying some of these um, ideas on how to create community how to recalibrate, how to you know, really connect up, and how to deal in both cases, actually, both with uh, environmentally sustainable strategies, but also with urban agriculture. And finally, I wanted, you know, I think that this is ironic, but uh, to go from one being uh, the, the home, the largest uh, sort of beach house in the 1920s on the West Coast, where, where William Randall Hearst and sort of cohorted uh, with Marion Davies to now um, the opportunity for repurposing it for the public. So it went from a public, a private mansion to a publicly accessible club, beach club. Um, a beautiful site, um, and here you see sort of uh, the, the site along the south the Pacific Ocean, and of course, uh, Santa Monica Bluffs. Um, and uh, it just opened six months ago, and uh, it's been very well received. And uh, although the community was really afraid that the homeless would descend, uh, the homeless sit on, ta on chairs and are extremely well, well behaved and good participants in this nice, socially, and uh, democratic um, space. It is uh, the, the People's Republic of Santa Monica. And um, we actually ended up, and it's not happening. Um, it's, if, you know, if we, we ended up not having to be, a, being able to actually, you know, as an example, put a full kitchen on the site because of uh, the fear that there would be nighttime events that um, would be out, out of control. Um, why it's written. I was thinking about Charlie Chaplin and Marion Davies actually swimming in the pool designed by Julia Morgan, which I wanted to show you. Uh, finding it hard to believe that it survived fires and earthquakes and other things. Uh, 
Um, so, the last two projects I'm going to share with you is our um, a brief. Um, one is uh, Mr. Mosa Park, which is uh, a window to the mountains. Um, in, in both cases, these projects actually try to sort of be these educational sort of uh, venues that actually allow people to understand their place uh, within sort of the urban ecology and uh, really start connecting uh, to, to nature in a way that they Um, and in the case of uh, this project, or in the case of Mr. Mosa, uh, what the idea is that in this park, which is actually a joint use uh, site, nine and a half acres, that was peeled off from an LA defined uh, high school, Belmont High School, uh, which is now the still one of uh, Allen High School, um, and uh, a new park was built. And the idea was that come there and they would understand um, what the local vegetation looked like, uh, you know, they would understand rocks and boulders and, and sort of uh, really understand what, what the mountains were about. So it's not going to happen. So we're going to close it to or my ending here. Really? Wow. Um, and, and so no way to get to the next project by advancing. Well, so we started. So just to say, I'm on 70. I can, I can dance. Okay. Um, so the last, you know, basically the last, uh, in the last project, which is actually stones throw away from here. Is uh, at the Natural History Museum, and we have been commissioned to actually uh, do a, a garden, um, if you want to call it that, or not, really an urban ecological exploration, working with about 20 scientists from the Natural History Museum, and looking at the site around the museum and see construction now, as you can see, it's mostly demolition, to really kind of come up with laboratory in a way, a new, a place where you could really start sort of understanding how this, how nature in the city um, can kind of coexist. What are some of the pressures related to water, related to air, related to immigration, because along with immigration and the and goods movement come many little critters. I've learned a lot. Um, and there are many cockroach Cockroach, rodents that are new to this area that are already starting to impact um, sort of our ecosystem. Uh, I don't know if you've all seen our parakeets that actually move um, from uh, actually they go from Malibu and they come to hang out in Expo Park. So the idea is that uh, we're tr we will try to understand sort of the the, the this this sort of new new paradigm in this laboratory and trying to find a way to really engage uh, visitors and it actually gets about a million visitors a year and so it's an opportunity to really connect and to connect uh, in, in a network and we are all linked um, and to connect in a network to the mountains and to start uh, sort of deploying citizen scientists into the community so that uh, people really understand what is happening in Exposition Park um, and how that relates to the way they can operate in their own sort of sphere of influence, but how it connects to the mountains and to the rivers and to the streams. And so this interrelatedness um, becomes uh, really important. And uh, um, that that's a project that we now have on the boards, um, which we are um, I wanted to share with you a little bit of a couple more minutes. Oh my goodness, uh, it's kind of hard, you know. The, the nice thing about uh, 
being a, a visual uh, professionist that you can always uh, show images. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, you know that it's it's actually a really fantastic project because uh, scientists are taking this opportunity really seriously um, and really starting to understand that obviously it's a laboratory that has to allow for um, people to engage. It is a museum. It's not a closed off, um, actually five acre site that nobody can access, but actually it's a five acre site that people are gonna have to be allowed um, to move through um, and uh, sort of engage in. And of course there'll be times where perhaps there'll be some closures. But how to you know, really make sort of uh, uh, ecology tangible and uh, sort of how to, to really refresh our thinking about urban ecology is something that we're uh, really uh, looking forward to seeing implemented. Um, and that's it. Okay, so if you could just get to the So I, uh, so I, I'm not going to belabor this. So I think that what I tried to share today is that if you start um, by really thinking about the way uh, a firm can operate in a big city, that the opportunity to work on projects like rivers, like streams, like ports, like um, airports, um, like uh, museums, all sort of come in, with, in, in time uh, to create a really uh, sort of uh, the potential for change. You know, I think that the potential for change um, and sometimes the projects are uh, really more about strategies, whether it's the low income, with low impact development, um, the lit, uh, sort of low income, you know, low impact development, sort of strategies that were just adopted by the city or other type of strategies like on, along the LA River for green streets and other programs um, that you can make change and you can impact uh, the world around you and uh, the, this is something that we have to value. So um, as a regionalist, and I share that word deep with Dean Ma, that uh, obviously in his case, his laboratory is 2,000 times bigger than mine. So his impact is uh, therefore uh, potentially 2,000 times bigger than mine, that, that uh, we have it not only to have, like I said in my initial comments, we hopefully aspire to a certain vision and we take risks and risks are really important and that we can't you know, rely on sort of the, our design egos that at some point it's not about a beautiful, precious uh, sort of uh, project that we're you know, publishing, but it's about sort of engagement and engagement in the world around us. And uh, I think it's a great profession. And I encourage uh, many of you to, to join this land army because we can make a difference. And uh, with Professor Harris, and uh, Professor Ma and a lot of others here, including Professor um, Aquino, I think uh, you guys are getting ready to, to join the Land Army, and uh, I welcome you all. And, um, and I'm sorry that the Mac didn't uh, let me do my last five minutes. I'd like to open it up to questions.